What up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Jesse Warden. Today, we're going to cover the OOP intermediate skills that you need to manage your OOP code base, your object-oriented programming. Before we begin, let's cover some of the things that we basically covered yesterday. OOP is a very large topic. It is a kind of a meta term, OOP, object-oriented programming. It consists of a lot of things that kind of fill within it. Considering the fact that JavaScript is a functional language, not an OOP language, like Java or C Sharp, a lot of these terms get very nebulous, especially from someone who's very not computer science-y like me. So let's review what we've learned, what it means, and how it can affect you, and I'm going to show you in the code, okay? So, number one, we learned about object-oriented programming. OOP, what does it mean? It's really just a umbrella term for a series of ways to make encapsulated code or black boxes, right? It's a philosophy on how you deal with objects, right? It originally stemmed from C programming where you had structs, right? Which are these objects that have, you know, a state and within them, they're not just one, they're one variable that has many different traits or properties within it. And then when you create objects within objects, you create these trees, right? And it's, it's all about programming around these types of objects. Object-oriented programming from a higher level has kind of graduated into classes, classes and modules, classes organized in these modules or packages or whatever else, right? So, the core of that is making sure that each one is responsible for only one thing and expressing it well in some form of API, a function, a set of functions, whatever that is, okay? That's where the encapsulation making black boxes occurs. So regardless of how big these structures get, each one should do one thing and do it well, okay? Loosely coupled. So as you have all these things, they shouldn't have tight integration about knowing each other. And that is just something that's gonna take years to learn. So I understand a lot of this is very overwhelming. You learned a lot if you watched the other video. If you haven't, and you already know a lot of the stuff, you know that there's a lot of things to learn. And sometimes you have to learn them multiple times to really get them to mesh into your brain, right? Burn them in. So again, it's all about objects, right? Really, objects or classes are just a very fancy object. Everything in JavaScript, including functions, are objects, right? Object-oriented programming. So even a functional language is based on most things being objects. We learned about classes, where you actually have a class that is an object, but it can participate in either composition or inheritance. So in JavaScript, it's a very loose definition, but the point is that the prototype allows you to do efficient classes, right? Whereas object, each time you create one, you create a brand new one in RAM and all the properties are duplicated. Whereas using object at prototype as a type of class allows a little more efficient way of handling methods, right? It's a little more organized, has a prototype chain to support some form of inheritance, right? We learned about instances, which are unique instantiation or unique objects of those classes. So each instance is unique. It has its own data, its own copy of that data. And the only thing it hopefully shares is the methods on the actual prototype. They all point to the same one, the definition. We also learned about inheritance, okay? You have a class that extends another class. Whether it's a animal gladiator or a human gladiator or a robot gladiator, they all extend the base gladiator class to have the majority of the code in there to support dry, right? You don't want to repeat yourself. You want to have that core logic saved there, right at one time, and then have others, you know, that have slightly different implementations of it be different, right? We learned about object at prototype, the whole point of putting things on prototype so you can have one copy in memory versus multiple. We learned about object create, how it fixes creating a new class on the prototype and how it has the correct constructor and how instance of and proto point to the right place and it all makes sense, right? In proto, we learned how an instance can say, what class am I? Well, the proto points to that class definition. In this case, the prototype of the class that it represents. Um, Object create helps set that correctly. And if it doesn't find a method on that, it'll say, hey, the proto walk up the prototype chain to find that method defined. So if it's not in its class, right? If it's not in human gladiator, doesn't have the role method, it'll look up the prototype chain and say, hey, well, the gladiator that he extends from has a role method, I'll use that, right? And why methods go in prototype, but properties do not. The whole concept of as soon as you change a property, all classes share that same property until you set it and then the instance gets a unique value so it gets a little confusing it's kind of like a static variable but not and it's a neat behavior from a efficiency perspective but it's really just confusing most people never change methods they always change properties usually unless it's read only thus it doesn't hurt to put those properties on there now you can optimize later right but premature optimization is the root of all evil right so that's why we don't do that and finally, we did a teensy bit of composition. We really didn't talk about designing a new structure via composition. Our composition was just using a class inside another class, okay? We learned about constructor functions. In JavaScript, a constructor function is a function, right? And with a capital letter to instantiate the fact that it's a class. So the class function and the constructor function are the same thing. We also saw in TypeScript that it's two different things. We learned about the new keyword. You can instantiate a new array 
you can instantiate your own classes via the new keyword. And that's kind of a way to get a new class, right? So rather than just making an object, you say new on that function and you get a new class. We learned about method overriding, where you can have a base class method such as Gladiator, but you can create your own on your own prototype and call that instead. Other advanced languages that extend JavaScript, such as TypeScript, allow you to do a, a, a more powerful version of overriding, where you can call the super method first, such as a super role, and add a plus one to that value, then return that. So those people can say, hey, gladiator.roll dice, but that particular implementation is getting higher rolls because the human's lucky for whatever reason, right? So we didn't cover method overwriting and we didn't cover method overloading, which isn't really supported, but you can do it. So we'll cover that in a future video. We learned about the this keyword. This whole process, this worked. It always pointed to the object we were talking about, whether you used objects, whether you use object.prototype, or whether you use object.create. This always worked. This is a very portable way. You don't have to hard code variables any, anymore. You can say, look, anytime I'm in a method or a function, right, that attached to a, an object somewhere, I can say this and know it points to the instance that it's referring to at the time, okay? JavaScript has no super. Play small violin, right? There are other languages that have it, but it makes it doing inheritance and overwriting and really, you know, normal oop things a little more difficult. So it is what it is. You can get a reference to it, but libraries kind of help with this. Lastly, how to implement static variables. I showed you a quick example of just putting a variable on the static and it works just like that. And we got a taste of ECMA 6 through TypeScript where it has basically the modules and the classes. That's really the parts of, of ECMA 6 that we really wanted, right? Was a more consistent class and extension mechanism and a more consistent and easily to use module system that's supported and official, right? JavaScript has neither right now. Again, just to go through the code and verify, we have our class constructor, right? It has our constructor parameters. This refers to the particular instance. Our Gladiator class puts the methods or functions, right? on the prototype so that way anytime we make a new gladiator object right or class whatever same thing that the object's row method points to one row method in ram this particular function ram rather than making a copy so every single one of them is going to have its own name property defined in ram so it's not very efficient but for role it's going to be efficient right same with attack target apply damage all the way down we also created a weapon class to use via composition so internally gladiators will have their own weapon rather than a string they'll actually instantiate it as a weapon Okay, so that's our teensy bit of composition. We have our inheritance using the good old object.create, which does have a fallback. So even though it's not supported in all browsers, it still can work using a simple fallback function. We have our example of composition error using a class within a class, not very fancy. And once we defined the prototype extension, we can then do method overrides, where our method overrides the behavior on that. So when we make a gladiator that's a human and we call this, it does this implementation rather than this implementation, right? We also have our other class that inherits or extends from gladiator called animal. And again, the only reason for that is he has a completely different target acquisition method, right? So, and he uses the old way of doing inheritance just to show that they can work side by side, but object that create is better. Finally, we use a new keyword to instantiate our brand new unique object, pass on those values to that particular constructor to set it up, and we can override later with a different weapon for the animals if we'd like. So we can change it at runtime, it's an instance variable, we can set it to whatever we want, okay? So this is also a kind of weird way of composition. You're basically setting a class on a class, not really in a class, but whatever. And that's really it, that's the review. So what are we gonna talk about today from an OOP perspective? So today we're gonna to talk about five intermediate things that deal with OOP. We talked about OOP and classes, but we've never really gone deep into code organization. It's very difficult to make encapsulated code unless your code is easily organizable. JavaScript does not really provide a mechanism to easily organize your code unless you use some form of libraries or transpiler or some kind of custom build process, right? So there's a lot of things that you can do using, you know, basically de facto standards that the JavaScript community's come up with the past decade that you can help organize your classes for a variety of reasons. I'm going to go over them today, okay? The first is code organization. We'll talk about how you can organize your code in class in classes in the files and how they affect each other and how they, you know, what load order they load into, right? This is a thing that again because there's no modules and package system in JavaScript, you are responsible for loading your classes in the correct order. Small projects, not a problem. Large projects, complete and utter nightmare. Refactoring and everything else just becomes completely mind-numbingly frustrating. So we're gonna talk about how we can solve those problems using third-party libraries or Transpiler. Number three, class scope on global window. We haven't really talked about the fact that we are polluting the global namespace with our classes. 
So if our code's running in our space and we're not using third-party libraries that have classes of the same name, we're safe. But usually as your project grows in scope and you use third-party libraries, not good, not good at all. You don't want to, you want to play nice with others. You want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We're also going to talk about the module pattern basics, which helps solve that problem and allows you some flexibility on what you actually do inside the module. Most of the ways that I and other developers utilize the module pattern is to house classes in a nice clean way without polluting global, right? And you can portably put it in your project and any other project and it doesn't pollute the namespace. You can control how you wish to use it. You can also easily unit test it, which we'll get to in a future video, but you can do other things. You don't have to define classes in there, right? Modules allow you to do a lot of things in there without putting things on global, which is very, very helpful and very, you know, promotes good practices. Global variables are bad. Okay. Lastly, we're going to cover closure classes versus prototype. Now I'm not going to go into huge in depth as to why, but I am going to give you a taste of how the two ways differ and why you should even think closure is value. A lot of people who've been doing JavaScript for a while and understand prototype think that it's a de facto way and that the benchmarks prove that prototype is best, but that's not really always the case. The benchmarks are not, extremely heavy in favor of prototype for a lot of applications that don't create 50 billion instances of it. It's not that big of a deal and code is more readable, right? There's scientific evidence that proves that less code is usually more effective producing software that works Ruby as opposed to say C for example. So closure versus prototype has that scientific data based on its side, as well as the guy who invented JavaScript promoted it. You know, those two things right there deserve, you know, some of your time to give it a look. Okay. So that's what we're going to cover today, those five things. So let's talk about code organization. In our original code here, we have these classes all over the place. So what you can do with JavaScript is you can load multiple files. Now, by default, HTML provides this ability via the script tag. And then the order in which you load the script tag is for the most part, sometimes the order in which it loads the actual script onto the page. So we're going to take our gladiator class. And we're going to put it in the file. So we're going to cut it out like that. We're going to make a new file. We're going to paste it in. Now there is a convention in the JavaScript world to make classes with an, a lowercase letter. And then the actual class name is uppercase. Makes no sense. I don't understand it. I don't do it, nor do I promote its behavior. Uppercase indicates a class. Lowercase indicates a library. It's just how things work. Not really sure how the JavaScript people miss that, but it's time to do things right. So. I'm going to make Galatia with capital G, JS. We now have our class inside of here. We're going to correct the indentation. Now everything's aligned correctly. So we have our constructor function at top and all our methods added here. Fantastic. That is our Gladiator class. Now you can see we've significantly reduced how much code's there. All right, step one done. Step two, our weapons class. Well, that's easy. It's a function. <laughs> how hard can that possibly be? Weapon JS. Correct our indentation. Voila, we are done. Number two, human. I'm going to grab this guy, shove him into his own file, human.js. Take our animal, animal.js. Correct the indentation. Now, if we want to utilize those classes, we just simply load them up in a script tag before our body script tag runs. For now, we're just going to put it in the head tag so we can say when the page loads, we actually have everything, we're ready to go. And by the time our body tag runs, it has everything it needs. So we're going to say a source attribute to the script tag to load in these files. Now, remember the first class to be utilized is the weapon because the gladiator needs the weapon. So we're going to have to do the load order in which these classes are loaded our own. You got to put it in your head. This is where libraries such as require.js and yupnope come in handy because you don't have to think it just works. Imagine that it just works. You know, you can actually be productive. Why would you want to be productive? You could build a client for making up your own custom build system. Don't listen to Jesse. So if you're a consultant, you really should build a client because why would you? Bad advice. Sorry. <laughs> no more cynicism promise. So we am going to get our weapon.js. Get our gladiator. JS, which is our base class, right? Then it doesn't really matter at this point, human or animal, doesn't matter who comes first because they're both subclasses. They don't have dependencies on each other, right? And that's it. Our code implements that. These will be defined on what? 
window, right? They're global. So if you look, when we refresh the page, before we even run, window obviously has 50 billion properties. Again, if you remember from our other global variables, window is a global variable. It's defined before your program runs. And any class or variable that you define without var inside of a function is going to be on there. So we can look for all our classes on there too, such as weapon, such as gladiator, right? They're all there. Fantastic. So our use of global variables will work. Now, Jesse Warden, I thought you said go was a bad. I'm getting to that. So let's just make sure that everything works. We can say, Jesse, he's there. Stanchated, human, got his functions, good to go. John, same thing. We can do our Jesse get random target in arena using the arena array, which is already defined. And it's always going to get Carl because again, if you remember from yesterday, our get random target in arena algorithm tries to find the strongest person in there, right? And attack them first. That's how Jesse works. You know, human gladiators work. That's their way as animals such as Carl the bear animals carnivores specifically try to get the weakest first, right? If they're hunters. So it's always going to get Jesse because he has the lowest hit points. Make sense? And again, our arena array has our humans and animal, and they're, they're nicely typed objects because we use classes or constructor functions rather than objects. So it looks like animal instead of object. We used object.create, so our proto points to a correct class. In this case, gladiator, as you can see. And our humans in the array are in the order in which they, they are put into the array. Okay? So far, so good. Our code is a lot more readable. And you can see that our classes are defined there. Human, JS, right? Gladiator, JS. They're all in nicely organized files. And if you're using something such as called source control, such as subversion, git, perforce, GitHub, and git are different. But GitHub supports git, right? That's really how it works. Uh, Bitbucket, CVS, and whatever TFS and there's a bunch of other ones that, that are out there. But basically, whatever you're using, you now have a bunch of multiple files, and you can share it with your team. So you, you, you can work on one class, and your other team member can work on another class, right? So OOP is promoting RAD development, also known as rapid application development, multiple developers working on the same code base together. So you can see these files are here, okay? Now that we have our files organized into separate files, and we can control the load order, our code in the front gets a little more organized. and I know we barely touched on refactoring, but as this grows in scope, you could shove it in your own class as well called main class, right? And put that in a class file and just say new main class and it does everything, right? So that's another way to organize this kind of front controller or main dude up top. So you can see how organizing your classes into class files makes it a little more neat, you know, easy to manage, easy to read. You don't have to have this massive line set of code you can read. And when you run, your code base, most browsers nowadays will support the ability to read uh, those particular class files and you can set breakpoints on those to debug as we've shown you in the past. You can now do it. Chrome is smart enough when it loads it in, so is Firefox and Safari. When you set those breakpoints, it can actually go to those classes and you can debug in those classes versus this massive amounts of code, right? So when you're talking to another developer or for a, you can say online 14 of the human class instead of online 14 of big file. Right? So it helps again from an organization perspective. However, what we haven't really touched on is how to solve load order. Right now, this is done in your head. Most, most languages, most tool sets, most compilers have load order handled for you. Java used to have a class loader, but they still have that combination with whatever, you know, whatever else the compiler does. Most languages handle all that for you. You don't have to think, right? Classes like Lua, and JavaScript, not so much. <laughs> like they don't even have classes to begin with. And you kind of added classes on top of it. Object that prototype was not supposed to be large enough where the cognitive load was more than you could handle. So this obviously we can all handle. We can figure, okay, weapon comes first. And if we don't do that first, then we get, you know, a problem if we don't do it first. So for example, if I do that and we go in our gladiator class and actually use weapon and we expect it to be right on global. Now, something I want to point out is the way we can get around this error is that it's defined in a function block, right? This function isn't actually really evaluated until we call it, so we can get away with it. But as soon as a module needs to utilize another class like this, and we try to run our code, you can see weapon is not defined. So as long as our classes do not instantiate those particular weapons and everything is loaded, then we're okay, okay? 
There are some cases in which the class will have it on prototype. So for example, here we're okay, even though weapons loaded after Gladiator, because it's not really actually evaluated until the function is run, right? Again, classes in JavaScript are evaluated as they are defined or as they're utilized, not like normal languages where all classes are compiled down into this you know, system and then you use it. So the Gladiator doesn't throw an error because weapons used internally, right? That's completely normal, good, okay, it's expected. But if I were to go back to remember the prototype before and actually define it on the prototype, which is evaluated as the class is defined, we would go default, let's just say weapon, new weapon, one and one, refresh, and as you can see, it fails, right? It has a dependency on that. So you're safe inside of a function that hasn't really been run yet because you're not going to instantiate your constructor, right? Because we're using object.create. We're not using the old way of doing inheritance. Um, if we did that, that would be a problem too. So for example, if we went to, what was it, animal, I think? And he actually utilizes Gladiator, right? If we went animal before Gladiator, you can also see animal is now failed because he doesn't have Gladiator yet, right? So class order is, is really important. You need to put it in certain order. Some instance variables, you're okay, but specifically dealing with prototype classes and dependencies, it's a big problem, right? So you need to main, maintain it in your head and think about it. So we'll fix up uh, Gladiator, get rid of the prototype. All right, so you can see how once we get our load order down, for the most part, everything works, right? What happens if you're working on a larger project and either A, somebody imports a library with classes of the same name, or B, you're using a, uh, a project you're working with a bunch of developers and they put a class with the same name. Say somebody else was doing a weapon and it was based on a complete rewrite of the battle system that had weapons combined with shields and multiple attacks and yada yada. So they said, okay, I'm gonna make a new folder and I'm gonna call it, uh, R and D, okay. I'm gonna make a new file and call it weapon. And it takes the parameters of what type the name is, how many damage dice does it do, and what type of damage die does it do, okay? So we have a name and what it, what it, what it does. You can also have some other metadata such as how many hands does it take to use it? Is it you hold it in one hand, can you use it in both, or can you you know, alternate, right? Maybe it's an enum. So whatever, we have a bunch of, you know, things that we have to add to it. So we save this as weapon.js, okay? And then we do to do comment, which means get to this later, I need to do this. So you can search your code with to do to remember what you were working on yesterday or three months ago, right? That's what to do really means. It just means I gotta do this later. So we then change it to R and D and this accidentally gets in there. What happens? How does that work? So go to window, weapon. And as you can see, the last one in wins. So whoever defines themselves on global is basically gonna overwrite it because window.weapon is just what? It's just an object. So if I say window.cow, it's nothing. So I say window.cow equals sup. Cool. And then I say window.cow equals no really. And then I say, what's window cow? It's whatever do I change it to, right? The exact same thing applies to classes. Weapon is what now? It's a class, okay. I'm gonna set it to false. So what is window.weapon? It's now false, it's not even a class anymore, right? So this is the problem with putting your classes on global. They're very ripe for overwriting and it gets worse with third-party libraries. When people use jQuery, they have multiple versions of jQuery, different versions of that particular library, the implementation. There's a lot of things that unfortunately leak on the global as we like to call it, right? So your goal is to make sure that you don't. Now it's not that much amount of work. It's basically memorizing the module pattern. Now it's called the immediately invoked function expression. All it really is is a function that basically shields anything from inciting it from getting on global unless they explicitly say window dot something, assuming window wasn't passed into them, right? So it's a way to create a, set something in a bubble and make sure it doesn't affect other things, right? In this case, doesn't put things on global unless you really, really meant to, okay? I wanna point out here that there's a variety of way of implementing this. I'm gonna show you the one that I believe makes sense. There's also a variety of different ways of doing the exports pattern. So you can say, it doesn't matter what way they load in. I'm really decorating classes. I think all of those are gross. They don't follow OOP and they make no sense for doing class-based development. Again, my perspective is from a OOP-based language, ActionScript and Java, right? And some, some Python and Ruby. 
So that's where I'm coming across. I'm going to show you that. If you, I highly encourage you to look at Adi Asami and all the other links I put in my description that give you a little more in-depth um, way of showing all the features that it provides and the various ways of doing it, okay? And again, we're going to revisit this later with the global injection so we can handle unit testing, okay? You don't need to know all that. All right, so let's get rid of our R&D weapon for now. <clears throat> so we have our classes. We're going to use the module pattern, which is basically an immediately invoked anonymous function or function expression is the correct terminology. Real quick, before we run this, I want to show you. We have a window with our weapon class on it. Okay, it's our normal weapon class with the constructor function that looks legit. We're going to add our function stuff, which is anonymous function expression with a function in it with the bracket, right? And then it defines the end bracket. So what I like to do is indent just the actual class. I like to mash all this stuff together, except for cuddling brackets, I don't do that. And then indent, so I know where my stuff begins, right? Now, it's good practice to return it, because if you don't, you can't get it, right? That's what's cool about local variables. Even though this is a function, uh, a declared function, it's still considered a local variable because it's an anonymous function or anonymous function expression that has nothing to do with global. So even though it's, it doesn't say var this, or anonymous function, this function is still technically treated as a local bar. So when we refresh now, you can see weapons not defined, right? So the way we do that is we return weapon from that anonymous function or module, right? Say, okay, our module, we don't care what you do internally. Just give us our class, please. Give us our weapon class. We know it's the weapon class because it matches the file name. That is a convention that I follow and many other programming languages follow. We have our module pattern, but we now can't access our classes unless we utilize two of the common ways to do module definitions, right? The first is CommonJS and the other is AMD. Now, they're not apples to apples or oranges to oranges. It's apples and oranges. They both handle dealing with modules in JavaScript. Now we need to make a delineation here. We're talking about modules or code organized in certain areas, okay? We're not talking about classes. You can take a simple variable or function, put it in a JavaScript file, use one of these module patterns, and it's a module, okay? Most developers who know what they're doing, building large projects, okay, not small things, are usually putting classes in the modules and loading the classes, okay? Unless you're dealing with third-party libraries, that's 90% of what you're going to do is put classes in these modules and load them. Now, CommonJS doesn't require anything. It's normal JavaScript and helps solve the window problem, but it doesn't necessarily help solve the global problem. AMD, or asynchronous module definition, does solve the window problem, solves the global problem, but requires some form of build step. Most people at the bare minimum are going to run line, one line of code on the, the command line to make the require JS file that handles all this stuff for you to build your files. Now, what does that mean exactly? You'll notice that each one of these classes is in a module, right? I could theoretically take them, put them here and say weapon equals that. I could say human. equals that. I could say gladiator. Let's put him up top. Equals that. Right? And animal at the very bottom. Equals that. Right? Get rid of all my script tags. Let's just cut it into the clipboard. Refresh the page here and check out window and see that I've explicitly added those classes because I returned them from the module definition, right? I could make my own object and call them Jesse's classes, right? And then manually add the classes to that particular object. So the window weapon goes away, but the good news is, is all my classes are on there, right? That's effectively what CommonJS does. It defines a modules object and then specifically expects all classes to be on the exports. So if we follow common JS, it would be something like modules and then modules that exports classes go here. You got it? Then your modules that export is passed around like that. So modules that export weapon, modules that export gladiator, on down the line, right? Now that's how you would do it if it was in a single file. If it's not in a single file, 
then it looks a little something like this. Upon returning the class from every single module, we now can take those module patterns and send it to classes. However, since they're now not dealing with global, how do we access global? Well, there's a couple ways you can get globals in there correctly. If you remember, we can overwrite global objects with functions. So for example, cow, if we say console.log window, and we invoke it, you can see that cow knows about the global variable window. But if we hide it with a local variable called two as a string, suddenly window ain't so global and ain't so JavaScript default anymore, right? It's a string. We've hidden it. So how do we get the global variable now, <laughs> right? We've kind of sequestered this function's ability to play with globals. That's usually a good thing. In this case, we're like, wait, what if we needed global, <laughs> right? Kind of a problem. Most modules shouldn't need global variables. So this ability to hide is the exact same thing you can do in modules. So for example, this last thing is actually the invoking part. It's the part that invokes or calls the function. You can put whatever you want in here. So for example, if we say in our weapons class, console.log window, same thing we did before. If, if Jesse can type, we'll get our script source weapon.js. And run it, cool, it's window, it's a normal global variable. What happens when we pass in two? And we do window this way, All right? We've hidden it, how does that work? Two, same as before, it's now gone. We have no global. So the key here is not so much hiding globals, the key is choosing what the global really is. So is the window global variable a global variable window? Or is it a string well you can make it whatever you want so common js kind of works the same way you have these modules right that you pass in and they go here and instead of returning weapon the amd way you could go modules exports weapon equals weapon now it's a little more complicated than this common js has a lot of strict rules on how you define things what the defaults are if modules doesn't exist default it to that blah, 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 but I'm simplifying it for you because this is the general way it works, okay? So now that we have window, we get this global variable that might not be global, right? We could pass in whatever we wanted. We can actually invoke this function ourselves to get it that way. You can, it's really flexible. It's kind of cool, CommonJS does that. So we can do that. And again, this is what Node uses, by the way, for a lot of stuff, Grunt and others, all follow this pattern, okay? So if you're curious about getting those technologies, learning the OOP ways of doing it here. Now when we run, we can go on our modules, so real quick, window, there's no window weapon, but modules has our exports object. And on our exports is our weapons class, right? So it's a wonderful way to say, I need a common way of not putting your specific custom classes on the global object, which houses the global classes, right? Because again, if something's on window, anybody and their mom can access it. I can go new array and I don't have to import window.array, right? I don't have to you know, access it specifically. Modules, you do have to reference modules specifically. You do have to reference dot modules dot exports directly, right? To get to your class and identify it's even there. However, it's still a global variable. It's still a single class. It's still a synchronous. There's still some build step of either A, bringing all your classes together in a single file, or B, somebody putting those files, you know, somehow in that particular module way. The cool thing is this can still reference these all files can stay as a single file, right? But at the end of the day, AMD and CommonJS have the same problem. They have multiple files. In this case, we have WeaponJS. If we were to add all our other files that follow the module pattern, our gladiator, our human, our animal, right? We now have four JavaScript files plus an HTML file. And again, from a network perspective, even though it shows one millisecond, that's not always true. The actual effect of loading multiple files, even if they're small, is actually slower than loading a slightly larger file one time. Each one of these HTTP requests, a network request to open, connect to the server, get some data, which is you know not instantaneous, you gotta download pieces of it at a time. 
then close the connection and give it back to the browser to use for other connections. That process is typically kind of slow. The more clients you have access in the website, the more files. So from a class perspective, it's wonderful. I have all my classes in separate files and it's you know easy to work with, whether I'm using common JS or AMD way, but it's not efficient way. So somebody at the end of the day has got to build something. Common JS, you're going to either build it into a single file or leave it alone and have a slow website, right? Because I only have like five files, right? If you're doing like a small Ember project. But when your projects get large and your JavaScript gets extinctionally, you know, significantly large, hundreds of lines of code, multiple developers contributing thousands of lines of code, not going to work. You're going to have to have some form of build step, both of them. AMD really doesn't work without a library. You're, you're, if you're, I mean, you can, but AMD, you're probably going to use Require.js. I have two long YouTube videos that go into excruciating detail about just the modules. They don't even touch the build step. Okay. Because by the time I got to the build step, I knew Grunt was going to solve that, so you didn't have to think about it. So that is the common JS way from a high level quick. I'll show you the AMD way without having to use global variables. To do it the AMD way, for the most part, if you're doing AMD, you're using require. Now the require JS people, Alex Sexton, James Burke, and all them, they are very clear to denote that AMD is a specific kind of agreed upon standard of doing asynchronous module definition that has nothing to do with require, they are separate. Require.js is a library that provides AMD support as well as a variety of other features, right? And also they're quick to point out too that AMD is not classes, okay? AMD can be a function, a variable. You can use require to load CSS files, text files, other things like that, right? But for the most part, if you're doing AMD, you're gonna use require. So if we're not gonna use common JS, why are we gonna use require? What's the point again? Well, again, keep in mind, common JS is strictly, usually from a server-side development standpoint. So a lot of the you know, the Ruby guys really repopularized JavaScript again. Python guys help too. But they're still kind of half server, right? There's a, a lot, you know, some are 20%, some are 80%. But the point is, is that they're still server side focused. They have that context, that perspective on where they're coming from, right? Client side guys, people like me, growing up in, you know, C, Java, whatever else, those kind of languages are 100% front end. We have very specific ways that we've, we're used to doing things, OOP based languages, right? That's where we're coming from. So AMD tends to work like that for a variety of reasons. Number one, we can deal with many different files, which are really synonymous with many different classes, right? So when we're debugging our code, we're, like I've showed you before, we're looking at the debugger in that particular class. Number two, AMD asynchronously loading your classes requires that somebody can now asynchronously load your class or your library, right? So it's not just for you, it's for other people to use your stuff. Number three, if you're going to use AMD, you're going to have to use at some point when you deploy it to the web server, you're going to have to use some kind of compilation process or a build tool. Now, again, CommonJ, CommonJS doesn't really require that. A lot of the people who do CommonJS do utilize build tools, but you don't have to. Right? You can put the module definition on a series of module definitions, keep your classes you know, global, or you can put on module exports in a single large file, whatever else they work. Require, you're not going to have all those files. You're going to put them in a single file at some point, right? But you still have the option to keep some things asynchronously, right? There's a lot of other benefits and whatever else to require this. What do we do to convert these? Well, we're going to get rid of the module pattern. And we only have to do one thing. So this is a crash course in acquire JS, okay? We're going to do something called define, which is a function. So it acts just kind of like the module pattern in that it's a local variable, whatever you define in a function, right? So even if we find a class, it's not going to be defined on global. So define takes two parameters. And again, for require JS, you need to memorize two functions. Define, defining my class. Require, require my class or use my class, right? Those two functions, that's it. So when you're defining modules, you say first two parameters. What's a list or array of classes I need? Weapon, he doesn't need anybody. He's his only class, he has no dependencies. Cool. The second, the function gets the classes when they're ready to be loaded. It's an asynchronous operation, right? When they're ready to be loaded, they're in there. Since we didn't load anything, the function doesn't give us anything. There's no parameters, right? We're done. Next, let's go to Gladiator. Gladiator does have a dependency on weapon, right? So that means his first and only parameter is weapon. Now I could name weapon whatever I want. I can name it cow. But the point is, you saw the highlight. I want to name it to what I'm going to actually use, right? So it helps to do that. The only time is you really massively rename things if you're doing crazy dependency injection or jQuery or underscore. Right, jQuery, you'd say jQuery, but you would actually utilize the dollar sign here, right? So that's how jQuery would work. If you're not familiar with jQuery, it's a popular library to do interweb things. Don't worry about it. 
So you could do that, right? So it's not really a global version of jQuery. So that's a way you can get around that. We don't care about that. We just care about weapons for now. Scroll to the bottom, paste in luggage stuff, which is at the bottom of weapon, which looks like that. Sorry about that. Paste in the gladiator. Go to animal, which has a dependency on what? Gladiator, that's right. So he will make sure to load weapon first, then gladiator, then animal. See, all the loaders handle, load order is handled for you. Acquire.js is so awesome. That provides some base functionality that every other programming language has. To be fair, Require.js has a lot of other features. I'm just being mean because it's late at night. And my kids don't want to go to bed because bed is lame. And see, I understand where they're coming from. Bed is lame. I would love to code all night. But that's not how the world works. And daddy always got to be the bad guy. That's right. I'm the bad guy. Sometimes. All right, that's it. We've now used require. We've switched our module pattern from the common JS way of doing things to the require JS way of doing things, AKA AMD or asynchronous module definition. How do we use it? Require. Let's test out uh, our existing code base. So let's, let's test that weapon first, just so you can see how it works. I want to use the weapon class, okay? And it's gonna come in as a weapon. And I'm gonna go bar test equals new weapon one and one, right? A one one sided die. Console.log test lowercase pro. Refresh the page. And as you can see, it works just fine. To verify that there wasn't some salapa coding that put some nasty stuff on global. Are you saying my classes are nasty? If they're on global, they're nasty. It's like cooties. You touch global with classes. Bad news, bro. There ain't no circle, circle, dot, dot. Now I got my, you know, oop shot. It's not happening. Just not happening. All right, this should generate an exception. And we'll put it below as well. After. So it'll crash. Fantastic. All right, so there is no weapon, class isn't defined after require once. It fails after the require function. Very awesome. So we know it's working? Now, let's do it for real. Let's require everybody. Now keep in mind, it doesn't matter the order in which I require the classes in here, okay? That only dictates the order in which they are appearing in the function. Again, require.js is smart enough to know load order. It handles all that stuff out, so it's not up to you. You can put the class that you require in any order that you wish, okay? So I'm gonna say animal and human, okay? Now this has to match, obviously. So let's make gladiator, weapon, animal, and human. And we'll take our original code, shove it, and require. Refresh the page. Now, as you can see, require.js has some errors that it provides by itself. Other errors are kind of internally and aren't really indicative or helpful. And this is just the growth of require. And believe it or not, it does get better all the time. He's getting a little better at providing more helpful error messages. So you can see it says an uncaught reference error. This is a specific JavaScript error. It has nothing to do with require. But you can see one of our classes is missing, missing inside of human.js, right? Usually when you see reference errors, it's usually because you forgot to put a class that's required, right? So unfortunately, Require.js is only so smart as you are about your class system. So if there's a reference, it's, it's not going to work, right? So we need to go inside of our human and require weapon because it's actually utilized, right? And we'll have to do the same thing, right? Let's use there. Do the same thing with animal. And again, it doesn't matter what order you put them in the array, as long as that, that array matches up with the function parameters, right? Gladiator weapon, gladiator weapon. That's good. Do that. Good to go. I no longer have any globals, right? Because it, again, it's inside of a function, right? So we'll take out the var and make these guys globals for now, just so we can play with the code in the console. 
Okay. And as you can see, Jesse's human. He's there. He's got his random attack. Test this good old random attack arena and method. Always gets animals because humans target their things. All right, so all the stuff works. Load order is handled and uh, stuff like that. Now, to optimize this for a production build so you don't have all of these JavaScript files, it's good to debug JavaScript files that are nice and readable, right? S small readable code. There's everything right with that. <laughs> it's when it's one gigantic file and you're like, where's all my stuff? That's frustrating. So. At this point in the presentation, you're probably asking yourself, Jesse, what does this have to do with OOP? Like, you're telling me how to build classes and modules and blah. If you can't build a class and agree upon with your developers or yourself how you build a class, and you can't grow your code with confidence, and you don't know how to do that, then you're not going to be able to do OOP. OOP is about flexibility, encapsulation, and constantly refactoring to make that better, right? You can change it as your program grows or as you have a better idea. Maybe do a code review with your fellow developers, whatever that is. So at this point, now that you have require work and you understand modules, you understand how code works and you understand how you can make the fine uh, AMD modules to put your classes in specific files. You can even put them in folders if you wish. You have now everything you need to know to build a class based system, right? That's organized in folders, that's huge, that grows, that requires many, many different dependencies. This guy only has two. They could have five. You could use other libraries like jQuery, you know, or an underscore for doing algorithms, D3, whatever, right? It's all there for you. Now that you have these tools, you are now capable of tackling larger class-based systems, larger challenges, all the things that we talked about oop earlier today, you they're now in your toolbox to use as normal. You don't have to worry about the intricacies of JavaScript. AMD modules, use and require solves, all that for you. Your next question is, great, then why did you show us all that CommonJS stuff? Those are the two popular, very popular ways of defining modules. You are going to get on a JavaScript project that is probably going to use one or the other. Now, I am a very pragmatic developer. I don't like to teach things that you're not going to use. So you, I've only said polymorphism, I think, in my twice in my entire video series. We're talking about OOP and, you know, a lot of things dealing with programming languages and object-oriented programming, right? And that's because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> like, I've told you everything you need to know, right? So CommonJS, even though I don't use it and I don't suggest you use it, unless you're a server-side node guy, you're going to run into projects where it's very important you need to understand how it works. It's also important to recognize how you can extend or utilize their stuff and make it integrate with yours, right? Part of programming is sometimes not just having a a nice clean environment that's safe. Sometimes you're going into situations where the code isn't yours or you have to work with somebody else who has a different opinion. Web projects are a mash of technologies. So they're more likely to have a variety of different styles of doing things than normal things like, you know, Python people write Python code their way. Ruby people have ways of writing Ruby. Um, even Java developers with a variety of different frameworks. Still, there's some Java developer, you know, conventions that apply to certain frameworks and spheres, right? JavaScript's not like that. <laughs> There's so much variety and everything else. So those are the two you need to know. I recommend require versus common JS for the reasons I've told you before. So now that you know this, before we start getting the heavy class libraries and some more advanced OOP topics, let's cover closures versus prototypes. So you've seen prototype based classes, right? Basically everything in here <laughs> is all prototype based class. Okay. But what you haven't seen is closure based classes. And let's show you that. So from a closure based perspective, the only real arguments that certain people have from closures is that jQuery is written with a lot of closures, not with prototype, at least the older version. And so a lot of other functional people have used closures. They abhor the prototype. They have just as much time doing objects and it works just fine. Closures are just that an object. So we've already done closures or objects. The difference and the reason it's called a closure is that it actually has state. So when you make local variables, they can actually live longer than when the function's executing. That's really all a closure really means to you. There's a scientific definition that does not matter. What matters is, is that a closure has the ability to do private. Prototype does not. However, prototype has all the speed improvements we've already talked about. It has inheritance, sort of. It has proto, right? The prototype chain, you can go up. You can define methods in one place. So from a RAM perspective, it's, you know, whatever. Browsers have optimized both closures and prototype. They are not that amazing if you look at the benchmarks, right? Even a mobile, but for the most part, you know, closures are a lot smaller and easier to read, I, I believe. If you're used to prototype, um, and keep in mind the way I've done prototype, you don't have to do it like this. 
you know, there's a variety of other ways to write prototypes. So before we start, you know, saying that closures are easier to read or these are easier to read, you can do this and define your methods like so. You can say role as a function, right? And what type? And you can continue to define your functions like this, right? So it's this one big block of prototype, a lot more smaller. So you can do that as well. Again, there's there's many different ways to write prototype classes, but the, the end effect is the same. They all have that. Closures offer a very easy way to do private, right? So you don't have to emulate it, it just works. So let's show you what a closure-based version of Gladiator would do, okay? So we're gonna call it our Gladiator closure and it's just a function also before I forget it's also very easy to do singletons a design pattern for making sure there's only ever one instance of a class in closures very simply so we have that it returns that function returns an object now your first thoughts of like Jesse I've already seen this this is one of the first things you did in oop what do you mean a function return an object I know that's all there is to closure classes they're not that magical right so we have our same constructor function, right? It's right there. We have our naming property, which is a name, attack property, which is attack, defense property, which is defense. Go defense! Hit points is hit points. And then our role function, which is our role with how many, what type, the implementation that's there, and on down the line right so attack target so you get it right that's that's basically it then at the end you return gladiator that's it that is a closure based class okay so that same closure based class also works with a common JS pattern you'll notice that a lot of node people in uh, node plugins sometimes will actually use closure based classes rather than prototype and that's just their thing too and that's fine it works there as well so again, this defeats the whole purpose of prototype, but look how much smaller this is and more tight. Obviously I didn't fill it all the code, but people like closures for that exact reason. They're small, simple JavaScript objects, right? They're very normal things that we mostly create. And the reason the prototype argument kind of gets defeated is that if you're not doing like a significant amount of instances, it really is not that big of a deal. The concern is for people like myself and others who are doing enterprise code bases where you have lots and lots of classes and they sometimes run on a mobile, right? Or slower machines on enterprises where they, yes, they do have IE6. They haven't updated in forever. They have tons of spyware and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> like it's just there. We can't say upgrade your browser. You know, we're not doing consumer based work. So it does matter that you squeak out as much as possible from JavaScript. And we're not even doing animations here. We're just doing simple, you know, form based applications. So from that standpoint, it makes sense. But again, even so, closures still run just fine. They're JavaScript objects. Everything you do in JavaScript is an object, right? So the optimizations that they make for JavaScript objects translate to your closure-based classes as well, not just prototype. What you lose is all that other stuff like I talked about, instance of, you lose the prototype chain. But as long as you don't do inheritance, who cares? Because what would you do if you're not going to do inheritance? Composition, right? So we still have our weapon. You can still do our weapon class in here. Right, we can say weapon is a a weapon of, I don't know, what was it, one and one? Right, so you can do it like that. Notice I didn't do new. I actually just treat it as a function, right? Because this function, I don't want to new it. It's actually a constructor function I just want to call, okay? So I'm not going to new the function because that would actually new this guy, right? So I'm going to take the weapon out and I'll show you how she can work in action. So I have my glider class. It's the exact same thing. The only difference is the way in which you use it. So for example, if I was going to instantiate a gladiator here, instead of saying human, I would do that. So the human constructor would take in and return a human object. The difference is, is that you're not going to get uh, the stuff you want to see at runtime. So for example, if I just take this normal gladiator class, okay, and let's take all this stuff out and let's play with gladiator. So we're going to say our Jesse Gladiator is Gladiator, but instead of saying new, we're just going to treat it as a normal constructor function, right? And as you can see, it's normal function, everything else, but you go back to your whole object thing. 
it's no longer like a class and Chrome shoots it up as a class object forever else. But I, I don't care. I mean, I don't care about this proto. I just want to see what are my things. I want to use it and call it a day. I want to be able to go in here and see a really small, tightly written thing. You know what I mean? That's what I want to, I want to be able to see. I want to like, okay. So lastly, you can do something called private. So whenever you make a var inside of the closure, this var above the return value does not actually die. It'll actually stick around if people inside of him actually use it. So for example, let's add a new function called say full name. And this says console.log my name full name is this dot name plus comma last name. And where's last name? And notice it doesn't have this in front of it, right? You can do an underscore if that's your thing, you know, and there's no real conventions that I've seen yet for it. But when we say last name equals warden, that's it. It's our local variable. No one can access this from the outside, right? It's a local variable defined in that particular closure function that runs, and this will run that one time. The downside is, is that this function itself will run every single time you do it. So this private variable is reinstantiated and gets, you know, attached, whatever else. But the fact that it's utilized in there, it'll actually stay around in something we used to call the activation object. It's actually called something else now. So when I run this and I say, hey, Jesse, I'm going to sneak around. So I, is last name here? No. Is it in the proto hiding? No. Wow, where is it? Well, it's in this magical place that you can't get to unless you provide an accessor for it, which we did. So Jesse say full name. Right? Jesse Warden. You can see the warden is in there, right there. Pretty cool. So that's provides private. The last value of closures beyond being readable as an opinion, right? And providing private, you can create singletons very, very easily. So instead of returning a function, we'll make our gladiator an object. Notice it is no longer a function. It is just an object. So anytime we get it, it's always going to be the exact same instance. Now, if you've never used singletons before, singletons are usually used for things such as uh, global variables in sheep's clothing or whatever, or wolf's clothing. I don't even know the analogy. It's, it's so late. The point is, is that singletons allow you to have one instance of everything. So for example, if you have an application which manages cursors, right? There's usually only one cursor on the screen. If you're doing touch screen, obviously it's many but most computer programs have one cursor. So all the methods and all the dealings with the cursor are put in the singleton class, right? Internally, the class will instantiate itself and store a reference to it as a static variable. That's usually how it does in OOP-based languages. So if you need your own singletons, like dealing with the window manager for the browser, for example, you have a single page application that doesn't run with multiple tabs, like it, it's in that single tab, it doesn't talk to it. That's another example where you can create a singleton to help manage those kind of things, right? So in our case, we just have our gladiator and we'll actually hard code the values, right? 10, 12, 10, and stick out all these other guys. So all we want to play with is gladiator for right now. And you notice Jesse points to the global singleton. We don't even have to instantiate it. Gladiator is an object, right? So you can utilize require to pass in or inject your singleton or global variable right, or global object around. Let's say you're doing configuration for your application, whether it's running development or local. It's another way you can do it. So closures are cool like that because you can very easily make singletons. There are so many articles that are so different on how you make a singleton in a prototype based language. It's ridiculous. So from a closure perspective, it's like just return the object, call it a day. <laughs> very simple. Um, another use case for singletons that I just remembered, uh, factory classes. If you're pulling any kind of data from a back end, it's usually the number one place where you have bugs, where you mangle the data for some way, or you actually get a null point, null value when it really was a valid value from the server. And the server guys say, look, the data's in a database. I don't know what your problem is. Your, how you're parsing that data is sometimes at fault. Um, you're not always bringing it as a JSON object. Sometimes you're converting it to something useful. So a lot of times your factory is no singletons. There's no reason to create an instance of your factory, right? It says static methods, one object that already exists. There's no reason to create multiple factories, right? There's no, they don't have any state. They just take data, parse it out and call it a day. So that's another use case. So closures are really easy to do that. Prototype, 
Not so much. So that is it. That's closure-based classes. Nothing magical. Um, I tend to like closure-based classes for a lot of service layers and things like that. If you're going to create a lot of instances, obviously you should be using prototype. You could also be using a class that handles all this stuff for you, like TypeScript. But, you know, whatever else. Teach their own. It depends on really what you're writing. Uh, the smaller classes actually can get away with closures, really because they are super readable. But, you know, if prototype's your thing and you have a style of writing prototype, that's fine too. The point is, is that, again, I, I like closure-based ones because I haven't had performance problems with them. But I work on teams that use prototype. I work on teams that use closures, right? So it's important to know both because you're going to get on a team where they use both. And again, I believe in teaching things that you're going to use. You're probably going to use both, right? You're going to get code bases that use nothing but closures. They don't even use prototype. So it's good to know how they work. And if some they have private variables, you know what they're talking about. Because you're like, wait a minute, JavaScript doesn't have private variables. Well, you can emulate them, right? <laughs> Using closure-based classes. So that's how it works. That's how require works. That's how common JS works. You now have the skills you need to do that. So let's review. Again, as you can see from an OOP perspective, code organization, multiple files. You can even put them in folders. If you look at my require JS video, I show you how to go about doing that. Multiple files, multiple classes and files, right? And each of the functionality belongs in that relevant file or that relevant class. If it gets too big, you make another class. Load order. Common JS, up to you. You're responsible for it, your build system, whatever it is that you do. Require JS using AMD modules, handled for you. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to put script tags up top. If you're using just a simple module pattern, right? The IIFF, immediately executing function expression, right? If you put your classes in there, whether they're prototype or closure, doesn't matter. Uh, you're going to have the same problem. You're going to have to think about load order. You're going to have to do the script tags. Lame sauce. Require handles that for you. But again, more classes, more load already have to worry about. Class scope on a global window. As you've seen, by default, everything we've been doing up to this point puts classes on the global scope. Your classes will collide with other class names. Last in wins. So if somebody has a class called window and it's in you know, the same namespace, it's going to cl clash. If you have the common JS and you don't put it on a com dot window or a R&D dot window, it's going to overwrite the previous window and you're going to get all kinds of strange behavior. So class scope on Windows, it's good to say, look, using the module pattern, you can prevent that from happening. You can use the common JS way to segregate it to a specific global variable, or you can use require, which solves everything. Seeing a pattern here with require? Number four, module pattern basics. You've got the module pattern, right? The IFFF using the function that immediately executes it's anonymous, so it leaves no trace of its existence. And if you do a bunch of class definitions in there, they don't exist when it's done, unless somebody gets a reference to it. In the case of common JS, or you manually doing your own load, load order in a single file or your build process. And again, number five, you've seen closure versus prototype classes. There are a ton of blog entries written about them. They espouse the differences. There's nothing fancy other than closures have private and they're easier to read for some people. That's it. And oh yeah, singletons are easier to make. What do you do? <laughs> hey, nothing magical. Uh, whatever else, prototype, you can you know have a lot of tools that generate that stuff for you nowadays. So it's not a big deal. So, that is the OOP intermediate things. That's all the tools you need to know to really get to the more advanced things of OOP. There's a lot to cover, but if you know these basics, we can ignore them, move on, and start actually coding and being productive and simple OOP examples. Again, my name is Jesse Warden. Twitter, hit me up on Twitter. If you got any questions, Google Plus. Don't forget to subscribe, please. And if you got any questions, you know, hit me up in the comments. Hope that it was helpful and thank you for your time. Peace out.